Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 385, featuring part two of my interview with the great Mark Baldwin. This part of the interview, we talk about his earliest games, uh, some programs that he wrote for the Atari 8-bit computer, and uh, which were published in magazines. That's always a fascinating era to talk about. Uh, we also get into Empire, uh, the, all the different versions of that, uh, the Perfect General, uh, what happened to Interstellar, some a sort of nasty stuff between Interstellar and EA that went on there, a hostile takeover, and much, much more. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mark Baldwin. All right, so let's uh, move into computer games then. And I was uh, reading about Trevor C. Sorensen and his company, I guess it was a Cygnus uh, starting out, and they published a game called Starfleet that you know a lot of uh, viewers of this program will be familiar with. <laughs> this is 1981, according to Moby Games. And eventually the Cygnus company became Interstell, I guess in 86, and later on was picked up by Electronic Arts. And my understanding is you sort of came into the picture uh, because you had a lot of Atari, you had an Atari 800, a lot of programming skill on that system, and you were... Uh, brought in to make a port of uh, Starfleet, the first Starfleet game, to that Atari platform. Am I, am I right here? <laughs> yes, that's correct. Well, I mean, all the principles for uh, Interstell were at, there at NASA as well. So I knew Trevor, and I knew a number of the other principals and so on. So these were your colleagues at NASA. Yeah, this was all NASA weenies or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you call yourself the weenies? <laughs> a couple of astronauts, even. Um, so, uh, yeah, they pulled me in to uh, convert Starfleet 1 to the Atari 800. So that was the, wasn't the first game I had ever done for the computer, but was the first box game I had ever done. I had had two magazine games published prior to that. <laughs> some and back some in of the those, viewers might not know what, that's, what that means, but you're talking yeah. about actually having source code printed in a magazine for people to type in. Uh, character by character and hope that it works. <laughs> what were yep, those that's games? That's what a magazine game was. You remember the, what the titles of those games were? Yes. Um, actually, one was a simulation. I did a. I put. There was a famous or infamous computer model of the growth of the human race done by. Um, oh. Some economics group, something of Rome or something like that, which was famous in the 60s because they this was early computer stuff. But they had built a model of the whole human race using resources, population growth, everything else. And this model basically said we're doomed. Uh, so one of the article code things I did was a was converting this model to work on the new microprocessors, i.e. the Atari 800. And so it allowed the person to program this in and then play with the various parameters and assumptions to see how things changed and so on, how resource usage changed and so on. Now this is, for the 60s, this was impressive. For now, it's primitive. Uh, but Basically, I did take this big mainframe, untouchable model and bring it down to the personal level. Uh, the other game I did was I created a game called Starbase 13, which was basically an attempt to try to get arcade action off Atari Basic. So I had to use every trick I could think of to get the computer cycles fast enough to make it feel like an arcade game. And it was semi-successful. Yeah, it's just you didn't do a lot of arcade games uh, that I know of. Was that the only one, or were there other? That's probably it. I had <laughs> I, I don't like Twitch games that much. I much prefer strategy games. But I like the challenge of trying to get Atari Basic to do an arcade game. <laughs> you kind of got me worried now, though. So this simulation predicted uh, doom for us. What was the deal? Running out of uh, resources or overpopulation or? 
It was a combination of resources, population, pollution, all the major factors and how they interact with each other. Club of Rome, that was the organization that um, actually created it. And it was called Limits to Growth. And so you could, pro it's pro there's probably a Wikipedia article on it or something like mm -hmm. that. I've been trying to figure this out ever since I played Empire back in, what was this, I guess 1980, sometime in the 80s, I guess when it was, I played it on the Amiga computer, by the way. Uh, and I was always curious why, even though it seemed like a World War II scenario with subs and battleships and all this, but you read the manual and it's all this sort of space commander, you know, and all the sci-fi stuff uh, going on. And I'm thinking, well, if they've got all this space technology, why are we down here with uh, airplanes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what? I'm, I'm, I, I, there must be more to this. There must be some uh, explanation for this, right? Well, the explanation was basically marketing. Uh, Starfleet 1 had come out. Starfleet 2 was in development. This was the core games of Interstellar. And so the idea there was that once I had done Empire, to integrate it into the Interstellar Starfleet worldview. So that's where all that science fiction stuff came from. Uh, secondarily, though... Um, the worlds were not, other than uh, sometimes when you built one like that, the worlds were not Earth-like worlds. In other words, they were randomly generated or weird or islands or whatever. So that kind of invited it to say this is on a different planet because we don't have those geographic formations on the Earth. So the two pieces work together on that. You know, it makes a certain amount of sense. I, I seem like I remember something in the manual where they were justifying this. Uh, I forget what it is, but you know, I, I, even on the cover of the box here, they've got like lasers coming out of the tanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I like uh, the pink general in that. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's great. Huh? <laughs> now, he's uh, Sorensen, right? Is that. Wasn't Sorensen a character in the uh, the manual? Commander Possibly. Sorensen? I don't remember. I haven't looked at. <laughs> I haven't. I wrote most of the manual, but that was, what, a long time ago, let's put it that way. Yeah, I studied this thing. Somehow this one's a demonstration-only copy, but, uh, yeah, from Grand Admiral Trevor C. Sorensen, Commander-in-Chief Staff Command. <laughs> That's pretty fun. So this was, he basically just wanted to tie the, sort of make a franchise, I guess, out of, uh, yes. tie mm -hmm. the franchises. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so let's talk about this uh, Walter Bright uh, character. <laughs> so, uh, as far as I know, and this is, uh, I found a couple of different dates. It's kind of hard to get accuracy on these things sometimes. But it uh, seems like he did the original version of Empire uh, way back in 1975 with Fortran uh, language on a PDP-10 at Caltech. <laughs> Does this all sound uh, right so far? It sounds uh, generally correct. Um, Where am I going wrong with it? Well, I don't know. Um, Bright came with a PC version of C version of the game to Interstell around 84, 85. I don't know any of the history prior to that other than what he said on that, and you can find that stuff basically on the net or whatever. I barely ever talked to him. Really? Yes. Um, in other words, he walked in with this C code. It was handed to me. I said, this is a good framework to start with, but it needs a lot of work. And so I basically redesigned the game, reworked the game from that point. I think if, I'm, uh, if I understand this correctly, his version didn't have a graphical user interface to it so you're the one no, it was a, it was a text based game so really you were I mean it would be unrecognizable without your contributions on it I'd like to think so <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I guess I can I sort of see how it could play out with ASCII characters or whatever But I would uh, estimate for Empire itself uh, maybe 40% of the code was his 60% was mine um, 
I don't know how we you want to break down how much of the design was his and how much of the design was mine. Uh, by the time we got the Empire Deluxe, none of his code was in there anymore. Um, you know, so, other, other than it, the graphical look up, other than like the graphics and stuff, were there any parts of the game that you changed? You know, that affected the gameplay. Or... Oh yeah, there were lots of different things I changed. I don't remember <laughs> what. Though. You don't remember like a, any specific example? No, I that? was I was looking at the starting core and saying, how do I make a great game for today's modern? Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, so he it, just basically dumped this code at you, and then he was out, he's out of the picture after that. Yeah, I never. Um, a few times I tried to even get, understand some code of his. I'd ask him questions on it, and I never really got any answers on it. So I, the only thing, the code was passed to me, and from that point, that was the only input I got. Well, this is, I guess, you've been working at Interstell for a while, right? Working on those. Starfleet games. When yeah. this so why, why were you the one selected to do this work? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently he only sold two copies before this. So. Mm. <laughs> All right, let's see. So where are we? This is about 87, I guess. And then you had the Empire Deluxe scenarios. And you know, I wasn't aware of this before. Somehow this had slipped past or slipped under my radar uh, but this is actually a pretty uh, awesome collection here we got maps by will wrights on there <laughs> yeah. uh, jerry purnell noah uh, falstein of what is the lucasfilm games mm -hmm. yes uh, several others uh, some i recognize and, uh, some i don't I mean, what can you say about what, what was sort of the thinking behind this and uh, it just sounds well, like a really fun project well, I, I just like the idea of trying to do an anthology for a computer game. We've ne I don't think I've ever seen an anthology after or before I did this. And basically, I used all the contacts I could think of of anyone famous and asked them to write me a scenario for Empire, or Empire Deluxe in this case. And they all contributed in, and um, I had a nice selection of different scenarios for the game. Right, so <laughs> it's been a while, right? So I guess we can ask this. So who do you think was particularly uh, brilliant with their, with their contribution? I, I don't even remember the scenarios that came in anymore. Well, I've read well, the, re Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I've read a few places where Sid Meier, you know, the Civilization, uh, creator of Civilization games, everybody loves those, uh, how he was inspired by Empire. And I think I think one of the stories I read was basically the way they created Civ was trying to find ways to make Empire better. And somebody, some somehow the suggestion came up of, well, how about having the technology evolve over time? You know, some kind of basically what led to the tech tree <laughs> and all that. So what what do you think about that? Well, I mean, Civilization is probably one of the best games ever created. And to know that I was somehow foundationally there in creating Civilization um, feels very good. Um, I like the idea. and but, but Sid, yeah, took the idea of Empire. But then he took it so much farther than where I had gone that it made it a great game. It seems like you were very close to this idea. You know, with the the space, the science fiction meets the World War II. And, you know, it seemed like somebody would have thought, uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could upgrade the troops? Or, <laughs> or maybe that would kind of interfere with the purity of the game. I've kind of gone back and forth about this, too. Because uh, it is kind of nice when you play empire just to have the units there and that's sort of it seems like you unless you focus somehow differently it feels a little differently uh, strategically uh, than a game like civ where you are where you do have to factor in this you know all these other technologies you, you know what i'm saying it's, it's kind of uh it gets to be kind of broad it's a different type of game right uh because you're playing in other spaces in the military space 
Empire is just playing in the military space. Civilization is playing in half a dozen economic, social, all sorts of other spaces of which the military space is only one small part of the full game. And so it's a different gameplay. It's a different feel and so on. Yeah, maybe it's just a vestige of my, you know, empire, <laughs> being a fan of empire. But whenever my friends hate me for this, but every time I play Civ, I'm always just stuck. I've got to be the, you know, the war, the war guy and the, the what's the victory? The domination victories. Like mm -hmm. I, I turn off all the other ones. I'm like, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> to uh, some extent, uh, I'm there, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't even care about the cultural stuff other than the you know, the impact it can make on more land or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I guess people that didn't play Empire probably feel much differently. Well, in the early 90s, uh, we get Empire Deluxe. And this is with Bob Rakoski, who sounds like a pretty interesting guy uh, himself. Uh, I guess he was an Amiga fan. Is this correct that you met him at uh, some kind of Amiga user group meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were looking uh, for somebody to do this work of uh, an Amiga version, right? I'm not sure. I I think I went to the Amiga meeting just to find out about the Amiga. And I met Bob. And we kind of hit it off. And I think it was after I knew Bob that um, Interstell needed Amiga versions of games. And so um, the first one was Empire. I, I'm trying to remember if he did Empire for the Amiga or not. I don't think so. I think we w did Empire Deluxe together, and he was doing the Amiga version while I was doing the Atari ST version, but we were both doing the whole thing or whatever. Um, I'm a little vague on this, though. <laughs> yeah, I saw something but, like he went. he was sort of a hippie guy, right? Uh, to some extent, um, <laughs> there's a little hippie in me, shoot. Oh, sure. uh, but we did work out well as a part, uh, as early partners, just, to, uh, doing conversions and so on. And then we, uh, worked together to form White Wolf Productions and that worked out as a very good partnership as well. Uh, he had strengths I didn't have. I had strengths he didn't have. So the partnership, it was a great partnership. I'm going to just go back a little bit because uh, there's a lot of fans of the Amiga that watch the show. Mm. You know, so you were wanting to know more about the Amiga. You know, Interstell was interested in the Amiga. You know, we know what happened mm -hmm. <laughs> with the Amiga later. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on it as a platform? Uh, I mean, I never had an Amiga, but I liked it as a platform. I had decided to go Atari ST and once you went one way, you didn't really go the other way or whatever. And I think I remember debating whether I wanted an Amiga or Atari ST um, when I bought my ST. And I, I don't remember the exact factors that made me decide to stay, maybe because I had had an Atari previous or whatever. I think there were vicious riots in London between ST fans and <laughs> Amiga fans. <laughs> they were so both. So you were the ST guy and then bought. Uh... Yeah, Bob was the uh, Amiga guy then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were friends, <laughs> despite this. <laughs> there was, uh, I don't remember that kind of a conflict. They were, at the time, they were both great machines which were pushing things forward. I think you saw more conflict between Amar uh, Atari and ST people versus Mac people. Oh, sure. Um. Because both the Atari and the um, and the Amiga were pushing the entertainment space a lot better than the Mac was, both in games, but also in video, in um, art, and so on. Well, it seems like I guess Mac was more focused on desktop publishing back then. Yeah. Well, in 1991, uh, we get the Perfect General. I get requests to cover this game all the time. I should probably do a whole show on this one. <laughs> uh, this is DOS and Amiga. I don't know if there were other platforms. You could let me know if that's so. Uh, but you had founded, by this point, you, you had founded this uh, White Wolf Productions company, right? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first, first, uh, maybe we could talk about that. So why did you want to, uh, did you leave Interstell to form this company? Was it going on at the same time? You know, just maybe you could sort of fill in the gaps between the uh, Interstell and the White Wolf Productions. Well, uh, Interstell had some problems. They had brought in a president who was, how do I want to say this? There was levels of non-honesty with the individual. Um, I had had some of my contracts violated. Uh, I was unhappy with Interstell. And I was looking for new ways to do things. And so we formed White Wolf. Um, we got did some stuff with New World Computing. Um, did Sorensen leave? Is that what happened? And somebody else came in? Yeah. So, well, Sorensen, I don't know if the story is he left or he was pushed out. So I guess elect electronic so arts I, had bought him out or something like that. Is that the usual story? <laughs> the, the story for that, I'm not, I was, I mean, I didn't want to get into the politics of it. I was a thousand miles away. Um, I think you need to go interview Trevor sometime and let him <laughs> tell you the story. Oh, yeah, sometimes. I like to hear from the, you know, sort of boots on the ground about these things. Because you were the one that really got felt the impact, right? It didn't hurt me that bad. I think it hurt him a lot more. But, I do, again, I can't say for sure. Um, but, I mean, I like the idea anyway of getting away from one publisher. Mm -hmm. So that was the nice nudge to get, get me there. It seemed like you, uh, you you sort of had a desire to publish stuff, put on the publisher's hat for a while before this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So White Wolf, I guess that's no uh, connection there to the, uh, oh, isn't there like a White Wolf? There's a White Wolf game. Uh, yeah, games. And they're more of a paper company. Um, we didn't pick White Wolf to conflict with them. I didn't know about that company right. at the time. So there wasn't you never heard from them about oh you can't call it that or no because they were st forming about the same time we were and the names were slightly different they were White Wolf Games we were White Wolf Productions so there was never a conflict on that um, obviously if I knew well they made much more of a name than we ever did um, if I knew that was going to happen we probably would have picked something else. But that's how things things happen. <laughs> oh, White Wolf is mean, such a cool <laughs> creature, right? Mm-hmm. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back uh, next week with a, a third and final installment of my interview with Mr. Baldwin. And uh, after that, it's still kind of up in the air. I don't know what I'll be doing, but <laughs> hopefully you'll like it. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You are 100% uh, funding this program, keeping these episodes in production, interviews of people like uh, Mr. Baldwin here, and uh, so many others. I really appreciate your help. Uh, I think you're doing a, a real service uh, for future historians or just people that like, uh, uh, you know, learning more about game history. So anyway, just thank you very much for that. If you want to support the show... Uh, you can always do it through Patreon. You can become a Ratreon uh, for Matt Chat. Only one buck a show. Uh, you can also do some other things. Just go to mattchat.us to f uh, find out some other ways. But you know, also appreciate it if you just like the video, subscribe, make a comment. Whatever it is you do, I really appreciate it. So thank you. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? It's a little bit of news. I've been extremely uh, busy with the semester just starting last week, as you can imagine. But uh, thankfully, I still have some uh, good news to share. Uh, one is, and the most pressing thing, of course, is uh, Empire Deluxe Combined Edition. Uh, this is the Kickstarter uh, for the basically the updated version of Empire. It's got 50 hours left to go as of this recording. Uh, they are up to 13,000 uh, with about 560-something backers. 
So if you haven't already pitched into that program, uh, go check it out. I think you'll like the campaign. Uh, pretty solid people uh, behind it. Uh, other news, are Arnold J. Hendrick, if you remember him, I interviewed him not too long ago. He's looking for help, volunteers, to help him redo Darklands for modern PCs. Now, I said volunteer, he's not paying for this, but he is uh, looking for experienced people. Uh, he's looking into getting the rights back for Darklands, but it might turn out to be a new property, and uh, that's okay. Uh, it sounds like it's still kind of in the uh, uh, brainstorming process, or sort, sort, just sort of testing the waters a little bit now. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, definitely go check that out. Uh, Stig wrote in about this, Dusk, a retro first-person shooter inspired by the 90s legends like Quake and Redneck Rampage. <laughs> Remember uh, Redneck Rampage? Uh, this one's got a soundtrack by metal music mastermind Andrew Holschult, who did a Brutal Doom, Rise of the Tree ad. Uh, Dusk unfolds in the eerie backwoods of the American Northeast, where uh, in the American Northeast, where gaining consciousness hanging on a meat hook, you must fight to survive. Anyway, check the uh, graphics out on this. It looks pretty fun. I think they've sort of uh, captured that uh, essence or uh, the, the look and feel of those earlier games. So I think it's definitely worth a look. That is uh, Dusk. Uh, and then uh, Stig wrote in about this too. EA dropping plans for a new single player DLC for Mass Effect Andromeda. Uh, apparently Andromeda didn't do so well. A lot of uh, uh, people sort of nit nitpicked it to death and in, in my opinion, I mean, there, it did have some flaws, right? But it wasn't as bad as uh, people made it out to be. Uh, but of course, uh, the Mass Effect uh, 3 ending, uh, <laughs> I guess some people are still losing sleep over that. Anyway, suffice it to say, it has a lot of haters, and it looks like they have uh, um, decided to either postpone or maybe just, you know, terminate this whole franchise. I don't think it'll come to that. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't look like very good news for the fans of the series. So, well, <laughs> there's that. Uh, slightly better news, maybe, is that uh, Microsoft is taking pre-orders for its uh, Scorpio uh, or its Xbox One X console. Apparently, this is the fastest pre-ordered Xbox console ever. That's, uh, that's saying something, I think. Uh, the uh, Scorpio or Xbox One X is going to have 4K games, spatial audio, more memory, blah, blah, blah. Uh, my favorite uh, thing that they're putting in is, is uh, favorite um, faster loading times. You know, this, this still irks me. Uh, so many modern games, you have to sit there waiting for the damn thing to load. Uh, so hopefully they'll be able to uh, do something about that. At least they're promising to. And it will also let you use your existing game controllers. Uh, another big thing for me, I hate having to buy all new controllers every time I get a console. Uh, so anyway, I think that'll do it for the news. And what about that Aeol of the week? All right, so this week I've got a Fentiman's full-bodied shandy. <laughs> uh, this is a shandy, and I'm not even 100% sure what a shandy is. Uh, but apparently it is brewed with traditional, it is a, this one has traditionally brewed beer, uh, but it's been de-alcoholized, so that it's uh, actually a non-alcoholic beverage. Uh, it is made with, uh, as I said, beer, hops, Got your carbonated water, sugar, lemon juice, and lemon flavor. So I guess that's where the shandy comes in. Must be kind of a lemon, lemony flavor to this. Anyway, it looked kind of interesting. I'm uh, trying to avoid the alcoholic beverages, so uh, this is like a nice alternative uh, since it is actually brewed with a uh, beer. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Fentiman Shandy full bodied here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Been kind of uh, mixing it a little bit, trying to get the uh, flavors, uh, all the flavors out of it. You know, it, it smells nice. It smells uh, very lemony, very citrusy. Uh, maybe a little bit of a malt uh, aroma to it. Uh, but really what you smell is the, uh, the lemon uh, part of it. So let me give it a taste. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when you first taste it, you taste the, it almost just tastes like lemonade. Uh, and that's followed by a kind of a malty, uh, vaguely sort of pilsnery like uh, taste to it, kind of like a real watered down uh, Budweiser maybe, or a, uh, oh, maybe like an Old Duels. You know, if you, if you can imagine mixing in uh, some lemonade into an Old Duels, uh, that's kind of what this tastes like. I'll try it again here. 
you know, it, it's not a bad taste. I think if you're out with some friends and everybody's <laughs> uh, drinking beers and uh, you don't want to be left out, you could uh, do worse than this uh, Vintamin Shandy. I'll try it one more time here. So yeah, it's got a, it goes down nice. You get this nice sort of lemony, rindy, uh, citrusy, uh, lemon zest-like flavor. Uh, very strong. It's not too sour, not too sweet. They kind of nailed that right. And then the uh, aftertaste is kind of uh, like a O'Doul's like a flavor to it. So <laughs> I don't know if that would appeal to you or not. Uh, I'm not a huge fan, but then again, it is a you know non-alcoholic brew, so they do the best they can with these. I guess I'll go maybe uh, two out of five drinking horns on this uh, Fentum and Shandy. I'm not really familiar with Shandy, so I can't give you a really good comparison on that. But uh, just personally, I think it tastes okay. Not great, uh, not terrible. Uh, you know, what can you say? I think two out of five drinking horns <laughs> says it pretty well. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote then. And I was uh, looking for quotes about Empire, and I found this one by Benjamin Franklin. And uh, this seems to be true of the game, as well as, I suppose, uh, <laughs> real-life empires. And it goes something like this. A great empire, like a great cake, is most easily diminished at the edges. So ponder on that, and see you guys next week. you like ran into these things before that's right wow man so like what did you do i died <laughs>